So what we're going to focus on today is one single decision, sell versus hold. If you want an overview of the whole uh, development uh, scheme, how to be a developer, how to run your own company, you might take a look at a presentation I did like this three years ago. It's on YouTube. We did it for Chicago for the ULI. Or you could take a look at the magazine articles, or, and here's the first advertisement, or the second, actually, Bob did a good job. You could buy the book. In the book, there's a chapter on sell versus hold. What we're going to do today is kind of blow that up to a half an hour talk. You don't need to take notes. Uh, this, you know, I don't think rocket science is rocket science, but <laughs> real estate definitely isn't. All right. I have a number of much smarter friends that I've met in ULI, and I asked one of them, if you were going to give your best commencement speech you know, to college grads, what, what, what would your best advice be? And he said, think 20 years ahead. Think 20 years ahead. And by that he meant, what are you doing today to get where you want to be in 20 years? What are your goals? And are you making the sacrifices you need to, you know, are you going to the night classes and whatever, to achieve those goals? So, and my wife tells me I should be a sports announcer. She says, I have a real talent for oversimplifying the hell out of everything. You know, every, everything's black and white. So taking that, where am I going to be in 20 years? You know, I'm talking to you guys who are 25 to 35 years old. <clears throat> where do you want to be? Do you want a big company? Do you want to be running a big company? Do you want to be doing the, the fanciest, splashiest deals in town? Uh, do you want to you know, be in the media quoted every week? Or would you like to kind of quietly build, be building your net worth? You know, those aren't mutually exclusive, but I have found often as not they are. So, strategy. Strategy is just another way of saying, where am I going to be 20 years from now? Where do I want to be? What strategy is going to get me there? And if you don't have a coherent strategy, take a look at this. Ah. If you don't have a coherent strategy, then I think you'll find that not only might you be making kind of the wrong tactical decisions, but you won't be able to, even if you know what they should be, to make the right ones. All right. In other words, another way of putting that is, if you haven't planned for the future, that the sell versus hold decision is going to be a luxury that you just cannot afford. Keeping with my oversimplification black-white model, there are two basic business models for developers, merchant builders, and investment builders. I think you all know that. The merchant build is essentially like a contractor with equity. Somebody who buys, develops, and sells immediately. Time-honored uh, approach. The ability to make money quickly, and you get to do a lot more deals on a merchant build approach. Guys in the back, um, it, let's take a moment here. We've got a number of people standing out in the hall. If we could just kind of come in and fill the sides, just so the guys can hear in the back. You might open those doors back there, too, just if, any, if those are, if that's not an electrical closet. Okay. <laughs> could be. So the benefits of a merchant build, you sell immediately, you get cash immediately, and you get to do a lot more deals. Investment build, and it, chatting with the guys before, the investment build is the other approach. That's the classic pure investment build is we never sell. You know, we build and we keep forever. The requirement on an investment build is you need a much higher yield, and you'll see that in a moment. And because you're going to be competing with merchant builders, what's going to happen? You're going to be doing fewer deals. If you need a higher yield than a merchant builder, you're not going to be competitive. So you're going to need more equity. Somebody from the Irvine company told me that they have a 200-year 200 200-year 200 outlook for their holding. So I said to myself, well, how do they know it's 200, not 175? You know, <laughs> no one's going to be around. All right, classic merchant builder. Uh, in a normal time, a classic merchant builder will build to 100 basis points. You all know 100 basis points is 1%. They'll build to 100 basis points greater than uh, the going cap rate. Investment, you know, those holding for the long term, want a much higher yield. They want 200 basis points. And let's put that into practice. All right, work through this example with me. You assume that your cap rates are 
then to achieve that 100 basis point spread, your return as a merchant builder has to be, what, 6%. If your cost is a million dollars, that means you need a net income of 60,000 a year. Everybody with me, the math is simple, don't take notes. Uh, you can do this in your head, and if you can't, you probably shouldn't be a developer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so take 60,000, divide it by 0.05, what do you get? A million two. A million two is a lot of money. That's a 20% profit on a million dollars. That's a good deal, but that's a merchant build deal. Because you can take that 200,000, but what can't you do? You can't hold that property. Let's, as far as I know, uh, long-term LTVs, that is loan-to-value ratios, the best you're going to do is 60, 65 percent. But to make this point, I pushed it to 70 percent. Even at a 70 percent LTV, you need 980,000, excuse me, 840,000 dollars. So you need to put in another 160,000 dollars, or leave it in, of cash on top of your 200,000 dollar profit. So you've got 360,000 in the deal, and you do the math. That's 9,000 in cash flow. That's a two and a half percent return particularly those of you who are going to do these deals, you, the younger members with a capital partner, they're not going to let you ha hang on to that for a long term. All right, so you build for 100 basis points, you sell. That, that's the basic message. Same deal. Same 5% 5 <coughs> 5 cap rate. I'm just going to disqualify myself to run for president, drink a drink of water, <laughs> among other reasons. All right, 200 basis point spread, that's 70,000 in income. Do that same math, divide 70,000 by 0 0.05, and you get a million four, $400,000 profit. So you can sell, take that $400,000 profit, or, you know, I should hang on to this clicker. Uh, or you can keep it. So at a million four, you can borrow 980,000. That means you only need to put, leave 20,000 into the deal almost your entire equity is your profit. Now, you still have the same lousy return, about 10000 a year, but if it's on $20,000 of hard money, if you want to, you can keep it. All right, now to take that general lesson and talk about what we do, it, it, our company, what we have done. My partner, Mike Powers, is here in the audience. We've been doing this for 35 years. 35 years ago, we had no money and no experience, uh, and now we have a, a little of one and a lifetime's worth of the other. Over the 35 years, we've done maybe 75 deals, and we sold two-thirds of them. I'll come back to that. Uh, we never intentionally developed on a merchant build basis, that is, that 100-point spread. Why? Because we're too cautious. That 100 basis point spread in a rising market disappears. Cap rates go from 5 to 6 percent. Everybody should be nodding. <laughs> You just broke even. Cap rates go to six and a quarter percent. You just lost money. Investment build isn't going to save you from that, but you're on much higher ground. The cap rates would have to rise uh, two percent, go from five to seven before you break even. And if you did what I just suggested, which is finance out right away, then you don't really care. If you have uh, very limited money in a deal and you have long-term debt in place, then your property is in essence like a long-term bond. You've got your yield. The value of just like a long-term bond may rise and fall, in fact it will, you know, with interest rates, but you're going to get all your money at the end of the day. Okay. Woo. But we, sell, we still sell two-thirds of our projects. Why? Well, in the beginning, we had about as much strategy as a grizzly bear. You know, bear sees, eats. You know, we saw deals and we developed, and speaking of eating, we had to sell because there's no money in it. Go back to that example I just gave you. The merchant builder gets $200,000. Let's say a warp speed deal, at least in California, start to finish. You see the property, you sell the completed project, it's three years. That's warp speed. That gets you, so you get 200,000 in three years. Investment build, that same approach, if you're lucky, in 10, you get 10,000 a year that kicks in, but that's kind of hard to live off. So in the beginning, <clears throat> we had to be merchant builders. And then, and then here's where I, do, I depart from a lot of my uh, 
confrères, you could say. A lot of guys, we decided, and this wasn't uh, like an overnight epiphany, you know, John on the road to Dallas. It was more kind of a, a gradual realization that if we never sold a property, we would have our financial partners forever. You know, if you never sell, you, you always need, where does the money come for your next deal? So it occurred to us that we should sell, give the financial partner his half, we take our half and buy a much smaller deal. And what did that buy us? That bought us independence. So as somebody quoted me, I've said this before, the realization was that we would rather own 100% of a million dollar deal, 100% of a gas station or a McDonald's or a duplex, than 1% of a $100 million high rise. Now, it looks really, you just say, whoa, that's my high rise. You know, I'm a partner in the deal. You know, I have a Brioni suit, but uh, much better if, from our perspective to own 100%. And then finally, today, McNellis Partners, we don't have financial partners, uh, and we don't have to worry about eating, obviously, but we still sell two thirds of the projects we do. Why? Because we think so often projects are at their very best on their first day, you know, opening, opening day when the mayor cuts the ribbon, that's when properties are at their best. Let's focus on that. So again, outside strategy, we don't have outside partners. We would like to think that we're growing net worth instead of uh, overhead. Uh, we have fewer, and I would love to think, are higher quality projects and we're trying to increase that uh, portfolio's quality rather than size. And of course, we manage our own stuff to control overhead. Now, back to sell hold. When do we sell? Again, not rocket science. We sell when the return is too low. I told you that we always try to develop for an, an investment build return, the 200 basis points or better. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, I wouldn't say often is not, but quite often, construction costs, and my contractor's here. Where's change order? <laughs> uh, construction costs get away from you. Um, sorry. Uh, construction costs get away from you, or uh, your leasing ex expectations aren't met. For whatever reason, you're back down to that 1% yield, and you cannot successfully uh, finance out. Uh, so we sell when the return is too low. We sell when the barriers to entry are very low. And that's physical barriers or political barriers. Let's, I don't want to pick on Texas, but let's go, let's pick on Houston. Uh, <laughs> great town. The problem with Houston is, as I think you all know, there's no zoning. You could build the best shopping center in the world, and then two weeks later, someone can build one just a little bit bigger and, and attack you. So if we were building in Houston, we'd be probably sellers all the time. And finally, we sell if we're not in love with our tenants, with their credit worthiness, or perhaps uh, just their business. And we're usually wrong on that. I thought Starbucks was a flash in the pan, so <laughs> who knew? Uh, and then we sell when we don't love the neighborhoods. And again, pretty simple. The converse, uh, when the deals do well so that we can finance out, we keep. When the barriers to entry are high, uh, we have a center in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz essentially goes from mountains to the beach. There's very little level land. And also Santa Cruz is politically impossible, Santa Cruz, California, politically impossible to build in. That's a good place to hold property for the long term. And of course we keep when the tenants in the neighborhoods are first rate. Okay, let's focusing the microscope a little bit more on, on the cell hold. We're gonna talk about Walmart. Uh, Walmart, by the way, has been a great partner for us. We've worked with them for over 20 years. Uh, wonderful people to work with. Walmart, oh, six, seven years ago, announced the Neighborhood Market Program. That's where they were going to come in and build neighborhood supermarkets, 30 to 50,000 square feet. They asked us, we're one of their preferred developers in Northern California, to do deals with them. And we ended up doing three. We did one in Stockton. I think you probably all recall Stockton was a poster boy for, um, uh, not malfeasance, but let's just say financial misfeasance. Stockton was in bankruptcy for three years. It's the largest town in, in the Central Valley of California, but it worked well for a Walmart market. This site, 
is actually an A plus location. If, if we're charitable and we say Stockton is a C plus town, this is an A plus retail location. You got two four lane roads, March and West there. Uh, they just paved it, looks like the day before this aerial shot. And we tied up this property, uh, five acres uh, with a 50,000 foot empty box. It was occupied formerly by Safeway, an another tenant that we work a lot with. One of the problems this center had, this is kind of a, a civic aside, is that it had been chopped up into parts, as unfortunately so, hap so often happens, and the owners were not uh, professional sponsors. They were not developers, they were not professional real estate investors. The center was half empty and the owners could not agree on anything. We came in, we leased this to Walmart, favorable terms. This is how it turned out, so it sounds pretty easy. Find an empty box, lease it to Walmart and go to the bank. It's not exactly how it turned out, but okay, keep this one in mind, Stockton. Now we're going to look at another one, Modesto. <clears throat> Modesto is a town about a half an hour up Highway 5 in the Central Valley. You could say Modesto is probably another C-plus town. Uh, same thing. This time, another good location, but this wasn't so much a kind of a quasi-regional location the way Stockton was. This was a neighborhood location. This was a coffee in Orangeburg, a nice little neighborhood site. Here's the site plan. This one was in Stockton, we just bought the, the Walmart building. Here we bought the whole shopping center. It was 50,000 feet. This one required more work. We had to relocate three tenants, uh, renovate the entire shopping center, and then we put Walmart in. And this one actually turned out, as Walmarts go, kind of cute. Uh, so, now it's audience participation time. Everybody has to vote on this. There are four possible alternatives. And, and of course, we're talking about sell versus sold here. Either we sold both, we kept both, we sold Stockton and kept Modesto, or the other way around. So you got to vote. Okay, who says we sold them both? Show of hands, please. Okay, that's like 1%. All right, we kept them both. You guys are smart. Okay, another 1%. Uh, we sold Stockton and kept Modesto. Okay, it looks like about a third. The other way around. We sold Modesto and kept Stockton. Okay, we've got a lot of independent voters here who haven't, <laughs> who haven't registered. All right, what did we actually do? We sold uh, Stockton uh, as soon as the paint was dry, uh, or, or the ink was dry on the lease, and we kept Modesto. And the reason why is that both, actually, let me focus on this. And the reason I, I'm using these as examples is that they're virtually identical except one little key difference. Obviously, they're both the same AAA tenant. Walmart is arguably the best retail tenant in America. Same kind of quality town, C plus town. You know, nice towns, but you know, and not uh, Laguna Beach. Very, lo very low barriers to entry for both. The, the city will give you a, a ticker tape parade if you show up and want to build a building in either. And both of the deals, frankly, were, were good deals for us. They w and, uh, allowed us, if we wanted to, to have financed out. So the difference between Stockton and Modesto. And you know, we're in the neighborhood uh, shopping center business. The difference was the immediate neighborhood. The Modesto's immediate neighborhood was, the barriers to entry were quite high because it was all built out within a mile or so radius, which is as far as this little center would, would extend, there were no sites. It was all homes. And I don't know if Leslie Pools, how big their reach is nationally, but it's a, a pool supply company on the west. When we see a Leslie Pool in a super uh, shopping center, that tells us there are a lot of pools in the neighborhood. That tells us there's a lot of disposable income. So it's kind of a, a, a good news canary in a coal mine. So we kept Modesto. That is pretty much on time. That is the prepared part of the speech. 
Uh, we're going to open it to question and answers. I have friends here who never sell. I have friends here who sell all the time. Before we do that, I would like to just take this moment to, to say, everybody in this room, all of you, are far better off, far luckier than 99% of the people on the planet. If you want to do something, uh, what I, I suggest to show your gratitude to God or Darwin or, or whoever, you know, give something back. You know, don't just write checks and give something back. Okay, I'm happy to answer questions. We've got a half an hour. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, did the fact that the rest of the, of the, the larger center, that was maybe a 160,000 foot center, did the rest of that, the fact that uh, we didn't control the rest of that center uh, factor into our decision? The answer is yes. <laughs> because we, we couldn't tell who they were going to put in or how long they'd leave it vacant. That's a good question. Next question. Yes, sir. The question was, do I like C plus markets? No, the answer is I like A plus tenants. So, <laughs> and if, if Walmart tells us, or, or Safeway tells us, or Ross tells us that they want to be in a particular town, you know, we have uh, one of the benefits of retail as opposed to some of the other disciplines is we have very long term relationships uh, with these tenants. And so it, it's easier, it's like a lot of things, it gets easier after 30 years. So if they tell us we want to be in Stockton, then we, we go find the best site we can for them. Um, yes, sir? How does market timing figure into decisions? Do you try to time the cycle? The question was, how does market timing uh, figure into our decisions? <laughs> That's kind of a softball pitch. It doesn't at all. Uh, I think if you have the ability to time markets, you should not be in real estate. <laughs> you should be on Wall Street. There's a lot more money in Wall Street if you can tell when markets rise and fall. Actually, we kind of view ourselves more like farmers. You know, we reap and sow every year. You know, we try to, you know, dry years, rainy years. We just try to keep building through it. Now, sometimes the markets make no sense and we'll pull back. But we figure the markets, the highs and lows take care of themselves if you just kind of stay in the market all the time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question was, I think what the question was is, is our portfolio worth more if it's, if it's sold as a group uh, versus the individual assets? And I think that's a market timing issue. There are times when, uh, and I'm not sure now is the time, and there are guys here in the audience who would know this better than I, when you've got somebody who's trying to aggregate He's trying to go from 500 million to 5 billion in a REIT, say, and he's actively out looking for portfolios of two, three, four, five hundred million dollars, and they will actually pay a slight premium. Ordinarily, uh, our sense is that you know, if, if you're trying to sell, you're much better off selling it off, you know, bit by bit. In fact, that's the problem with that Stockton shopping center. You get a higher cap rate selling off the Chevron on the corner, or excuse me, higher price, lower cap rate, sell, you sell the Chevron. You sell the jack-in-the-box. You sell the supermarket. And you know, you're selling to offshore investors that people don't know what they're doing. And then suddenly, the center starts to, its death spiral. Next, yes, sir. Uh, you gave us the Walmart example, but uh, <clears throat> what is your favorite product type and why? Uh, the question was, what is our favorite product type and why? And our favorite product type, and again, this wasn't so much, uh, no, no, no one told me to to figure this out 20 years in advance. So we kind of figured it out as we went. Our favorite product type is a supermarket anchored neighborhood shopping center in a highly competition constrained environment. Uh, so, uh, and so uh, my best example of that, to those of you who've been to the wine country in California, there's Napa Valley and then there's Sonoma Valley. They're, they're separated by some little hills. In Sonoma Valley, there's a town called Healdsburg, a great little wine town. Uh, we have a, the, uh, the largest center in town, and it's not that much, it's 100,000 feet, but it is absolutely bulletproof. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, frankly, this is way off topic, but 
I do not think the internet is all that much of a threat to uh, retail. You know, I, I think common wisdom has that wrong, but I'm positive it's not a threat to, to supermarkets, pizza shops, nail salons, uh, local banks. So that is, is our portfolio, our court portfolio consists of you know, neighborhood uh, supermarket centers. Yes, next question. You, sir. You know, I'm, the question is, uh, when we sell, what about taxes? I'm so glad you brought that up, because I, I, I have notes here, and I manage not to look at them. So <laughs> we sell when we can, we've, we've traded. Uh, and in the 80s and 90s, trading worked really well for us. And, and the idea was we, we'd buy something, fix it up, and then we'd trade, and we'd buy, you know, the old joke, uh, we buy junk and sell antiques. You know, so. <laughs> That, that's what we did. You know, we bought junk yield centers and then we fixed them up and then sold them, took the proceeds from one and traded into two more junk yield centers and fixed those up. But about five, six years ago, the market got so hot that, and you remember, to, to trade, you all know this, you have to identify in 45 days and then trade within 180. Uh, we were unable to do trades. You know, the, the trades that we saw happening, we thought, in fact, we did a, the last bad trade we did was in 2006. We, we traded into some woebegone dirt in northernmost California that it took us 10 years to, to get out of. So we just pay our taxes I, uh, <laughs> it, when we have to. We just say, it's time to get this guy off the shelf. We'll pay the taxes. If we can trade, we do. Uh, I wish I had a better answer than that. Yes, ma'am. Can you give me more of an example, so, please? Um, then I'll repeat it. Let's say it's a data center facility. So you're spending $10 million a year in capital improvements, but your returns are really high. You had mentioned you hold on to assets if your returns are good. But I was trying to understand how you evaluate risk, but it's a risky asset. The question was um, like a data center, something that there's, there's a high risk involved. That goes back to that earlier point. If we don't like the tenant's credit, or if we don't like the tenant's business, we'll sell. We, we do, wait, this, this has happened to us. We do not like to end up with, a, with an empty supermarket or an, an empty restaurant uh, where we put a lot of improvements in. So if we think that, the, it, and occasionally we're wrong, occasionally we'll sell something and we say, damn, uh, sure like that one back. But as often as not, the ones that, that we sell, you know, we're glad that we did. You know, and if the, the next guy who buys from us makes money, that's more power to him. More questions? Sure. Uh, the question was financing strategies. Uh, again, this works for a, a small shop. Remember, we do a couple deals a year. The way we do it, we... Um, by paying uh, taxes, we got liquid. And uh, one of the things we did with the, the money, we paid down loans on some, of, on some of our principal assets. So a number, four or five of our principal assets, have no debt. So we use those as security for a fairly large, at least for us, a fairly large line of credit. So when we want to buy a property, we buy it off the line of credit. And then we redevelop it off the line of credit. You know, I'll pick a number. Let's say we buy something for $5 million and it's going to be a 2 or $3 million redevelopment. We don't get an acquisition loan. We don't get a construction loan. We just buy it off of our line of credit. If we know from the get-go that we're going to sell that property, then we sell it and then pay back the line of credit. If we've decided, like the Modesto deal, we're going to keep that property, then we'll go out and get a permanent loan and replace the line of credit with that. It's pretty simple, and it avoids a lot of uh, transaction costs. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, well. My name is Sam. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you, by the way, uh, 
sure. So as like a young guy who would like to develop, uh, but maybe isn't fully there because uh, to reference your earlier question, some of us are looking for financial partners. Uh, but uh, the idea is uh, for a young person to really step into development, do you suggest going to like a joint venture approach, finding a, an older gentleman who maybe <laughs> you had the energy to, to, uh, and, and letting, letting the young guys utilize sweat equity to get into it, or is it to go find another older gentleman uh, who doesn't do real estate and, uh, and, and borrow that money effectively and appropriately to do gas stations or something like that? Yeah, uh, the, the question was, how do you find your, your first uh, financial partner? <laughs> it's like developer seeking generous older gentleman, yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen versions of that in the, in the personals. <laughs> and, but you know, actually, successful developers sooner or later hang up their spurs. It is hard, folks, and, and most of you, since you're in the business, it is hard going to a planning commission meeting and getting your ass kicked until 2 a.m. Uh, sooner or later, developers, the, the ones who've made money, uh, I think they are good partners because they totally get the business. And you know, sooner or later, successful developers morph into financial partners. Uh, we're doing that. We have a few younger partners. Sometimes I feel like, uh, uh, like a captain on an aircraft carrier. And I have these three or four young guys who are little fighter pilots who are out there zooming around trying to find deals. And then, and then they fly in and, and report back. I think that's a good way. And, and going with someone who understands real estate, it's much easier. Uh, usually, most people start out with family and friends. It, Usually, you go to the, the uh, generous older gentleman and say, look, I've done three or four deals with my family and friends. I've made them all 20% a year. But guess what? I'm not a Rockefeller, so I've run out of friends with money. So, <laughs> you know, and and that's, that, that's the usual transition. You burn through all of your fraternity brothers or sorority sisters' money. And, and if, if you do well, that they tell their friends. But sooner or later, you have to, to if you're going to be successful at this, you've got to step up to another level of financing. Now, Ron? Yeah, and uh, when you're doing, uh, looking at a piece of property in a high barrier in the neighborhood, uh, how do you analyze risk in terms of do you love to be in that neighborhood, um, but you don't know what's going to happen with the homeowners around you? Do you just option it and figure out and make a decision in six months, or if you can buy at the right price, do you buy it? And how do you analyze risk? The question was, how do we analyze risk? Uh, uh, I think one of the keys to surviving as a, a developer, a small developer with kind of a limited capital is being very, very risk adverse, being very careful with risk. Let's go back to those two examples. Walmart, great company, great to work with, but Walmart, you all know, encounters a little pushback from neighborhoods. So on the Stockton deal, on that very issue, were we willing to step, on, step up and buy that empty box before Walmart was fully entitled? No. So uh, I think we ended up, we got maybe six months free, uh, as they say, on the purchase contract. It took us about 18 to 24 months to get that fully entitled and to get the building permits so that we knew that we would not have neighborhood opposition you know, blowing up the deal for us. What we did there, I think we paid the seller 10,000 a month, non-applicable, non-refundable, you know, and the cards were on the table. We said, look, this, that's 120000 a year. Excuse me. That's more money than you're going to net once you, you sell this property, pay the taxes. And he said, yeah, OK, I get it. So that, that's, so. In, in our thought was we'd rather risk $200,000 uh, and then walk away from that. Modesto, on the other hand, it was a, it's a great little location in, a, uh, in the prepared remarks. I didn't really focus on that. But it was such a strong location. We had two, if not three, major tenants interested in it. And also, we bought it when it was 70% empty. I'm doing the Bill Clinton thing. 70% empty, uh, but we got a 5% return on our cost. Even So we said to ourselves, it's got a little bit of an oversimplification. It's like we got 70% of it for free. So there. We said, screw it. We just bought it. Just stepped up and bought it. And, and it's much easier to negotiate with tenants when you own the property. You know, and it's hard as a young developer, because if you're trying to take no risk, you're, not, you're never going to pull that off. But, and 
owning a property is a good way to say, you know, take it or leave it. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, do you get a better sale price uh, if you hold and show that uh, what the, the tenant sales are? Uh, you know, typically we we know we're going to sell from day one, so we don't typically do that. And then sometimes we'll have we we have a couple properties. Uh, one we've owned for thirty years that I'd be happy to sell, uh, and maybe you do get a better uh, price because that one uh, we. We have the, the tenants at drugstore. Uh, we have their sales you know, for the last 30 years. I, I think you do. But if it's, if it's a Walmart, if it's a Safeway, the buyers don't care. You know, uh, th those things are, are kind of fungible. All right, more questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, the question was, was there ever a time that we had to take too much risk? Yeah, and, and, and by the way, I, I, it, we've lost money pretty much every way you can in real estate. So uh, it, for the, the sell-hold discussion, I tried to kind of simplify it. But yes, you know, we have lost money. Yes, we have taken too much risk. Uh, and you know, when you step up and buy something and, it does, and then the tenants that you think are going to be there uh, aren't there, uh, the land, the, I, the land we traded into in 2006, Walmart. This was like five acres, and Walmart was going to buy uh, the adjoining 18 acres. So we were going to be building the outpads, and Walmart was going to be building uh, the 18 acres. We stepped up and bought because it was trade money, and then Walmart said, "Oops, we're not going ahead." Uh, perfectly good business decision, but we were left holding this land. Uh, now, fortunately, we had paid all cash for it. Uh, Bob Hughes. Uh, my good friend, uh, one of his lessons, uh, and it is worth repeating, is never borrow money to buy land. Uh, th that's worth the price of admission here. <laughs> that, that is good advice. More questions? It's warm in here, isn't it? I see people. Yes, sir. Uh, can you discuss your lease structure? Are they long, uh, how long? Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, percentages of leases? Okay, the question was, can I discuss the, the lease structures? You know, it, we're retail developers. So the leases in, in retail, it, I think most of you know, tend to be triple net, meaning that the tenant pays taxes, insurance, and, and occupancy costs. Uh, we push on major tenants for as long as possible a term. Uh, giving options, there's another lesson. <laughs> giving options does not benefit you at all. You know, you think, oh, okay, sure. It's like throw some more shrimp on the Barbie. Here's four or five year options. Don't do that. Uh, all that does, uh, once you burn through your primary term and you're in these five year options, you can't finance the property and the tenant basically controls you. Uh, so we push on those ground leases. I think they were 20 year terms. Mike, does that sound right? Uh, so uh, and we, we're doing a ground lease today with Safeway, it's a 20 year term. Um, we try to get at least 10-year terms from kind of junior anchors, you know, the Ross department stores of the world. Small shops tend to be three to five-year terms. Percentage rent uh, works occasionally. We have two tenants, I think, in, out of the portfolio that, that are in percentage rent. Usually somebody's made a mistake, or it's usually a very old lease, like one from the 70s, and there's percentage rent being paid. or you've set the rent too low, or, or the tenant's doing extraordinarily better. We don't push too hard on percentage rent. I know a lot of people do. More questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Would we do a deal with all percentage rent? Uh, the question was, that it, it, do I agree that the, I, I, honestly, I don't know, that, but the, uh, the observation was the Irvine company, uh, that's Donald Bren, he was a very tough guy. He insists that everybody pay percentage rent. I'm sure that's true. 
but I'm also sure that he insists that they pay top of the market rent to begin with. And so with that top of the market rent, you're usually a long way from the tenant's anticipated sales. You have to go from here up to here in order to kick into percentage rent. But I, I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Yes, sir. Oh, so the question was, yeah, I mentioned that Leslie Pools is, is a good indicator of, of uh, a good neighborhood because if you have a pool supply company, you have a neighborhood full of swimming pools. Sure. Uh, so what are other tenants that, uh, I'll give you good and bad. For If someone shows us a, so a shopping center that has a, a Starbucks in it, that says you know, disposable income. If a shopping center has a couple of uh, mainline banks in it, that says disposable income. On the other hand, if there's a karate studio, not so much, <laughs> or a, a dollar store, so, uh, but you know you you can do perfectly well, and and we have, at least we have had karate studios in the past in some of our centers. Yes, ma'am, uh, both of you, but one at a time. Uh, can you try that question again? I'm not quite sure I understand. Okay, so the question was, did, because the Modesto, there, was, uh, there were higher disposable incomes, uh, was Walmart perhaps the, uh, you know, the wrong tenant? You know, should there have been a, a slightly higher end market there? Is that your question? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it, what we do, we rely uh, on the research of our tenants. If, if Walmart says, you know, and they, they all have very sophisticated research models. So if Walmart says, this is our demographic, you know, this is our income level, you know, we do not second guess that. Um, and in fact, it, the mistake we have made, in fact, we did in Palo Alto, a, a recent mistake that cost us a couple million dollars. So we put a too high-end market in a, a new project that uh, failed miserably, and then we had to take that space back and, and redo it, and we came in, and this is one of the richest towns in the country, we had to put in a, a super discount market uh, to backfill it. You had a question, ma'am. Yeah, that's a good question. She's, sell versus hold uh, presupposes buyers. If there aren't any buyers, then you, you have to hunker down. What we do, uh, it's a good question, is we try not to have too much debt. Uh, you know, so that if, if there's a property that we want to sell but there's no buyers for it, we'll just keep it on the shelf until the market gets better. I, I wish I had a better answer, but yes? Okay. Sure. Uh, that's a subject I think most developers love to lie about. <laughs> uh, you'll, in fact, all of you, if, if you stand around here at the cocktail parties, you'll, you'll hear these guys say, oh, no, I never guarantee anything. Well, they're not quite telling the truth. The, the way the guarantees work, I think everybody does a, what's called a completion guarantee. If, if you're in construction, if, you, if you're building a project, you guarantee that you will finish the project, not necessarily that you'll lease it up, and not necessarily that you'll pay the money back, but you're guaranteeing that you'll finish that project. And the biggest companies in the world give that guarantee. Now, they don't give it, if your company is big enough, if you're a publicly traded company, then they don't give that guarantee personally, but the company does. The repayment guarantee, that's different. Those you can sometimes get away from, but. The small developers, the guys starting out, forget about it. You're going to give a repayment guarantee. That says no matter what, and it's, we're only talking in construction, no matter what, I, John, I'm going to pay you the bank back. So that means in addition to taking the construction risk, you're also taking uh, the lease up risk. And to your point, the, the, the risk that, that there might not be buyers out there you know, to get you out of it. But it takes a while. You have to work your way up to a point where you can get away from repayment risk. 
excuse me, repayment guarantees. Um, and the way you get away, it might, <laughs> he just dropped his stuff. Uh, the, the way you get away from those is by put, the hard way, which is putting up more equity. If you put up enough equity, uh, then I, I think you can get away from a repayment guarantee. Yes, sir. The question was diversification. Uh, do we hold residential? Uh, we have one small, um, a very low income apartment project that we, we built and kept as part of, of a mixed use project we built. The way we've diversified, it's a really good question. We ha so we develop shopping centers, and so we know that business. But we also happen to be in Palo Alto, which is uh, a tremendously successful town. So our diversification has been to trade Valley retail, this hasn't been a bad deal for us, into Palo Alto office buildings. Uh, and they're, they're totally different beasts. Palo Alto is subject to the, the tech world, whereas the, you know, the supermarkets in the Valley are, are much more kind of bread and butter. So that, that's how we, but we haven't wildly diversified. And in fact, our development is all within a two hour drive. I didn't say that of San Francisco. We, we are, so as developers, and this is what I would also recommend for anybody starting out, is you specialize, specialize, specialize in a product type and in a location. Yes, sir. Did the potential location go dark when uh, Walmart did downsize last year or what? No. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> That's a softball question. The question was, did the Modesto location go dark? No, I am pleased to report that that Modesto Walmart just kicks ass. It has a huge volume. Uh, and, and that little center does very, very well. It, so uh, back to, uh, you know, I said we typically sell uh, in the valley. That one we, we kept, and we have a, maybe one or two more assets out in the valley. Yes, sir. There were two questions in there, weren't there? So, okay, so, yeah, the, the uh, good locations stay good locations, tenants come and go, and sizes come and go. We've been around long enough that when I started, supermarkets were 30,000 feet, then they grew, they ballooned up to 60,000 feet, and anything that was small, you know, was obsolete, and now it's trending down the other way. Uh, and so what happens when you have an empty box? Yet what we, we've done, in fact, we did a deal. We bought a Kmart uh, in a town called F Fairfield, 100,000 square foot, and then we just tore it down to the, the bare concrete, and we split it into three spa four spaces, just subdivided. Uh, you have to buy it right. That's expensive to do. Uh, but it was, in, the, in hindsight, it was better than tearing the whole building down. So uh, adaptive reuse. Questions? It must be raining outside because you guys. <laughs> All right, yes, sir. Have you done deals involving incentives like property tax incentives or the tax credit incentives for what are your feelings on the risk and reward associated with using incentives? Uh, the question was have we done deals with tax incentives? Uh, good question. And the, the, I think the only one we've done in, in recent years, I, I mentioned we built. We did a mixed use project. We had a supermarket on the ground floor. We built very low income uh, housing on top, apartments. We, we did do, uh, in, in, in fact, I think the thing yields zero, but we, we got great tax benefits. But it's very hard to do that. Uh, Mike spent a couple years of his life working with the state and the federal government. Those, those credits are available and they're great, but they do not make it easy. It's very expensive to get and you have to, I don't know how much more time and effort you have to spend, but Mike does. But it, um, it's not something we seek out. There we, go. we have a few minutes left. Yes, sir.
the question was, what fees w would I suggest for somebody starting out in order, you know, this, how do I eat? Uh, you know, I would complain about the phones, but it looks like it's mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, sorry about that. Uh, what fees? In fact, I, I just saw a young developer sent me a package, uh, and he had uh, a couple percent acquisition fee. He had a financing fee of a percent. Uh, he had a, a management fee. He had a going out fee. He had a whole bunch of fees. And I understand the need for those fees, but if you're trying to sell that older, generous gentleman on your deal, the, the simpler you can make it, where you say, look, Jack, here's the deal. You put up the million bucks, you'll get a 5% preferred return. I'll take a $10,000 fee just so I can eat. And then you get, all, you get your 10% and your money back, and then we split 50-50. So the generous guy knows that you're totally on his team and, and you're not feeing it to death. That is a much easier way to, to sell and, and get a financial partner. But, in, and again, another good reason to go with a guy in real estate, he will understand the need you know, for, for some fees. Um, you can typically do two to 3% of, of total uh, hard and soft cost as a developer fee if you're doing a project. So a couple million dollars, maybe you get forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 built in as a fee, and no one objects to that. Yes, sir? The question was, uh, and a great question, I like that, is have we ever, you know, we're, we're in business to make money, but we're also in, in business to do the right thing by communities. And the question was, have we ever turned down deals because we didn't think it was right for the community? I'd say yes, I can't think of one offhand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about lightning bolts coming down here, but uh, it's more, we, we turn down deals where it, it just, uh, my, my favorite measure of success, you know, you ask rich guys, you ask private jet guys, how much is enough? And they, 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 they never have an answer. They always, in fact, the, the Rockefeller quote, was, he was asked, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Uh, you know, and it's frustrating. But I think a great measure of success is when you can choose with whom you do business. And when you say, you know, I don't need to deal with that tenant or, or, or that seller or that buyer or, or that city. Uh, you know, whether it's, it's a moral thing or just that guy's a jerk. Um, and there is, there's at least one notorious jerk in our business. Um, <laughs> Questions more? We're almost done. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been an amazing audience. Thank you so much. I, I think the book is in the back of the room. It's $12.95. If you like, I'll, I'll be more than honored to sign it for you if you want to buy a copy. Thank you. Okay, it's right out in the hall.